Hello, and welcome to the Wade Borth Podcast. I'm your host, Wade Borth. And in every episode, my goal is to get you to think differently about how money works and ultimately to empower you to take control of your money and your personal financing system. Hello, welcome back to the Wade Borth Podcast. Today, I'm going to share with you an interesting experience I had that reinforces the conversation we have about banks and really, yeah, how do I say this? It's, it's going to be a good example of, of why you want to be financially aware, be in control uh, as much as you possibly can. So uh, a while back, I say a while back, a couple of weeks ago, uh, when I'm recording this, somebody had written me a fairly large check. Uh, they were trying to, let me back up. They're trying to transfer money from their account to my account. And when I, I mean, fairly large, but it's probably not fair to say. It, it's, it's a big enough amount that it's worthwhile to pay attention to. How's that? And um, so they, they tried a couple of different times to get money from their account to my account. Now, we both agreed that that money should be coming to me because of a purchase that we did. They were like, hey, we want to get you this money. And so uh, they started off the process. I'm going to tell you this. And the reason why I'm going to go down this, uh, give you a little bit of the why is that I want you to understand why banks make it difficult for you to transfer money from one individual to the other. Because they started out with, uh, let's let's call them Chase Bank. And they started out with, hey, we want to transfer this money. So they were going to send it just a, via a, a paper check, a, a bill pay through their, through their account. So they go through the process. And when they're going through the process, uh, they came up and they said, no, we can't do that. And again, they never really gave them a reason. I think it was the amount was too much or... Not sure what the deal is. They had money in their account, but the money wasn't able to come out of their of their account. So um, they go, all right, well, that's not going to work. Then, hey, how about if we send you a paper check? I'm like, hey, that's fine. Whatever. It works fine for me. So they sent me a paper check. Well, I take the check and I go to deposit it. And Wells Fargo on my end, again, I, I love using Wells Fargo because they're, they're easy to pick on. They came back and they said, uh, oh, by the way, we're going to put a 10-day hold on this check. I'm like, 10-day hold. It's transfer from one individual that wants to give me money back to me. And so I call them up. I said, hey, they want to put a 10-day hold. And they said, well, we just got a notification from our bank, these, this, other, this other bank, that they're not going to honor that check that they wrote on that account. This is absolutely how crazy this is from, from bank to bank. Now, you have to realize it's going from two of the largest banking institutions in this country. And, they, and they're not making it easy on us whatsoever. So that other party felt kind of bad. They said, hey, how about if we wire you the money? I'm like, yeah, sure. Wire me the money. So they canceled the transaction. We stepped back and they said, hey, how about if we wire you the money? Well, their bank, Chase, is telling them that if they wire the money, then they're going to have to freeze their account because of all this activity, right? So they tried to uh, do a bill pay, send a check to, you know, have the bank send the check. They wrote us a check, and for whatever reason, they they weren't going to honor their own check on the account that had money in it because uh, Wells Fargo was putting a, a hold on those dollars. And so now if they tried to wire the money, they were going to put a hold uh, on their account. They were going to freeze their account. Well, I, I didn't want that. I didn't want them to freeze their account. But just think about how crazy this is, is that they've put in so many obstacles for us to transfer money from... Hey, from a party that wants to give me money and a person, me, wanting to take that money. And so uh, they said, well, we can't wire it. They won't send a check. And if we do get a check, you're going to have a 10-day hold on this money. So what would you like to do? And interesting enough, the teller there said, hey, how about if uh, you just we give you a cashier's check, which is, uh, again, a cashier's check for people that are not familiar with it is a check that a bank writes and they're gonna make it out to my account. So Chase to Wells Fargo. So this, the check is coming out of Chase's account because again, the money's in that client's account. So the money comes out of that client's account, goes into the, the Chase account, and then Chase writes a check from Chase Bank to Wells Fargo. So I'm like, hey, that makes sense. You know, it'll be available. So they do that. I take it, they actually went over, uh, walked it down the street, deposited it into my, into my Wells Fargo went to find a Wells Fargo branch, deposited it there, and I get a notification that there's a now an eight-day hold on that money. So why does a bank put a hold on a check? Because they don't know if the check is any good. So I find it rather interesting that they they don't even have they don't have faith in their own system that this money coming out of Chase is any good, even though the, the check is written on Chase. Now, 
again, if they just said, hey, it's going to be a one-day hold, we want to make sure it's real. You know, there's a lot of fraud. I can I can appreciate that, but an eight-day hold on this check. Now, you have to realize that we've been going through this process for about eight days now. So it's kind of the back and forth. And again, it's not like I needed it tomorrow, so it wasn't like it was real urgent, but now it's just becoming quite funny. And it's becoming a good illustration of how banks, why they want to hold on to, to money. So, and, and the fact is that they have a system set up to make it difficult for you to transfer money. Now, at the end of the day, we probably could have did a wire transfer. It would have been a whole lot easier and a lot cleaner, but then it's 25 bucks to generate and 25 bucks to receive. So they're getting you, they're hitting you pretty heavy when all we had to do is, again, if you think about it, if Chase, the bank Chase itself writes a check and writes it to Wells Fargo, which is this, you know, another of the largest institutions in the, in the, in the country from banking, <laughs> that should be good enough, I would think, but they don't trust each other enough to be able to make that happen. So everybody I talked to, they're all apologetic, but they just, they kind of have their system. But again, so I sat back and I thought about it. I'm like, why, why are they? being so difficult to transfer this money again person i know wants to give me the money i want to receive it so the two parties that are involved they want the transfer to happen but where the issue comes is with the bank and the process now part of it is do we know all the ins and outs of, of the banking system absolutely not so my job is now to <clears throat> go learn and understand that a little bit more so as we want to transfer money do we find a better way to do that so that's the first step but more importantly having an understanding of the reason why they make it difficult, it's like anything else. They want to hold on to those dollars as much as they possibly can, right? So they're saying, hey, we're going to make it difficult. So what does that mean? So you think about it. And let's say we take $10,000. Let's make that the number. It's $10,000. If they're able to hold on to $10,000 for an extra 10 days, what does that mean to the bank? Can they, can they process? You know, and again, we have to understand what banks do with money. They don't hold it in an account. They don't hold it in a vault. They turn around and they turn that money, you know, eight, nine, 10 times as quick as they possibly can. So if they can put a drag on this for 10 days, can they turn that money for 10 days or 10 times within those 10 days? Probably can. And what they're doing by, by doing that, they're able to charge interest, origination fees, so on and so forth. So what, what they're going to lose out by, by transferring it immediately, I, I don't know what the number is. But I know it's got to be fairly significant because, again, if they're if they're going to wire the money, which is immediately leaving that account and immediately going to my account, you know, there's fifty dollars to be made in that one moment transaction. So I share all that with you just to kind of get you to think of, again, we talk about the banking system and we talk about why it's important for you to control as much of that function as you possibly can. So, do we still have to use the banks? Absolutely, we still have to use the banks. We can't run. A transaction we can't run commerce in this in this economy that we're in without the the credit unions and the wells fargos and so on and so forth would we have been better served by having credit union and credit union probably so i don't think we would have had this problem if it would have been those credit unions but again sometimes we keep what i call national accounts so we can do this all over the country but but i'm kind of rethinking that process is that maybe we don't need those national accounts because it doesn't seem like it's a very efficient way to transfer dollars so I wanted to share this with you just so you kind of understand that banks at the end of the day are not your friends. They're there to make themselves money and they make lots of it. And they think in increments. They think in, in minutes and hours and days versus years, right? We've been taught to think about APR, annual percentage rates. That's a whole year, right? So we think, oh, it's 6% or 8% or whatever it might be. You know, on $10,000, that's peanuts. You don't think it's that big of a deal. But what do they lose in a day or two or 10 days? If they can hold on to that money for an extra 10 days, what can they earn? And then they do that 10,000 times, 10,000 transactions throughout a year. Man, now you're starting to talk some real dollars. So I guess my point to this is, A, I wanted to rant about it a little bit because I just found it really interesting, a lot frustrating, a lot of time spent on my part and the other person's part trying to get this done. But more importantly, um, just... Again, we, we talk a lot about you have to think like a bank. You know, you need to be in a position where you're thinking like a bank. And so from that standpoint, we got to think incrementally about our money as well. So when we're transfer, or when we're using our policies and we say, hey, we're going to take a policy loan to go do X, we have to be real intentional with those dollars. And we have to have a plan and we have to be organized with those dollars. And, you know, having an expectation of having it come back is very important. So... 
again, the idea of this of infinite banking isn't so we can replace Wells Fargo, uh, but understanding how they make money so we can emulate the good things of how they think about money and make money, but also understand when we keep money there, they're making a tremendous amount of dollars. So if I'm going to keep $75,000 in a savings account, why would I do that at Wells Fargo? Why wouldn't I keep that money in my policy? So it can make me money versus making somebody else money. Right. So why not keep it my system and, and with with a company that that you know I'm a part of because it's a mutual insurance company. We have our policies with One America or a mutual insurance company. Why not keep it there? And so the money is stays within our system versus going to Wells Fargo. And again, this is just a great illustration of how how they control the the flow of money, right? So this is how they control the flow of money. And when they control the flow of money, then they can charge and, and they can multiply this because the Federal Reserve allows them to do uh, fractional reserve banking. That that money that didn't get transferred out of Chase right away, they were able to use it. And then once Wells Fargo got it, they put a hold on it for 10 days. So they were able to use it without me having to transfer it out. So um, I guess that's probably the biggest thing, just the awareness, the financial awareness that banks, uh, how they think, and when you when they have control of your money, they're going to try and keep control of it as long as possible. I guess that's probably the best end of the day thing I want to get across is like when they have a hold of your money, they're going to want to try and keep it as long as possible. And so don't think that, hey, it's a day here, 10 days here, because to us, maybe it doesn't, it doesn't seem that bad. But again, we've been taught to, you know, we think in months and we, quite frankly, we think in <clears throat> when it comes to payment, we think in the monthly payments. Uh, but when we think of growing money, we've been taught to think in annual percentage rates but banks think in days. They think in hours, quite frankly. So anyhow, I wanted to give you that example. Just my frustration uh, it continues to go with Wells Fargo and other big, large banks just because of the administration and how difficult they make it is make it for us as consumers to move money from one person to the next. Uh, we still need them. We still need them in our economy. We we have debit cards. We have checks. We, you know, we still have to do that. But just think about where you're storing your dollars. If you're storing your dollars with any kind of financial institution, why not have it be a financial institution like a large life insurance carrier that's mutually owned that benefits its policyholders versus a Wells Fargo or Chase that benefits uh, themselves and, and the shareholders in Wall Street. So anyhow, give that some thought. Love to hear what you have to say. Uh, pop on, uh, leave some comments, like what you're hearing, share this podcast with other people. I would love for you to start sharing the things we have to talk about on the, the Wade Borth podcast with other people. And comment on those things that you like, and I'll look at those, and we'll see what we can do to produce more of that content. Because this this is it's fun for me to talk about. It's frustrating to go through that process, but when we get back to the end of it, I love to be able to sit back and go, "Hey, what were we what were we experiencing? What did we learn from this?" And I like to share that with the, with you, the listeners. So, anyhow, um, like and, and share the podcast, uh, leave comments, and you know, hop onto sagewellstrategy.com, take a look around some of the other podcasts we have, the blogs. And, um, you know, look forward to, to speaking with you soon. If you're enjoying this podcast or know anyone else that might be interested, please be sure to hit the subscribe button and please leave a review. This will help this podcast reach and help more people by ranking higher in searches and ultimately help more people get out of financial bondage. And don't be afraid to share this podcast with your friends and family as we can be easily found on Apple Podcasts and Spotify.